السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد Respected brothers and sisters, respected viewers, uh, welcome to WhatsApp, Sheikh, where not quite as it usually happens, uh, this is your brother Shamsul Duha hosting. We don't have our regular host today, uh, Brother Ma'arul from Brother Shabir, mashallah, they normally do a wonderful job. So today, uh, we came up with the idea to have both myself and uh, Sheikh Yusuf Abdul Jabbar together on the show. Sheikh Yusuf, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, so we basically have to wing it today, Sheikh Yusuf, <laughs> without our hosts. Yeah, we'll manage it, inshallah. We'll manage. Inshallah, inshallah. So, respected viewers, so it's the two of us. Um, so, there'll be a slight difference in format. We'll be chatting a lot and discussing some of your questions as well, as well as some of our own, if you don't keep us busy. And, um, yeah, and so, I don't know. I, I guess we're both guesting and hosting at the same time, I think, if that's the right, if that's the right phrase. And... Uh, uh, so, yeah, send your questions in. You know the format of the show. The show is about you sending your questions in to us uh, via WhatsApp. At least that was the original idea. But, you know, I'm, there's lots of different ways to send questions in now. But the most important thing is there's no calls. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to get through questions a lot faster than usual. So we tend to get through more questions on WhatsApp, Sheikh, than uh, other shows that I've done where people get to call in as well. I know it would be wonderful to hear the voices of our viewers, but this just enables us to put more answers out there and for people to learn more, inshallah ta'ala. So uh, you, I'm, sure, I'm sure you can all see the, the WhatsApp number. So uh, just, you know, punch that number in and WhatsApp us your questions and uh, we will receive them here, inshallah ta'ala, and answer them. So, Sheikh Yusuf, um, I can't resist it, but a question came in it's a bit of a joke but i have to i have to i have to kind of ask you so that we can have a quick laugh about it so our first question on today's show is um should whatsapp sheikh be renamed to telegram sheikh <laughs> so sheikh yusuf what do you think um jo jokes aside this is actually a very serious question and i've been contemplating um not sure what to do with all the different groups that I'm in um, because WhatsApp have announced, you know, openly they'll be collecting data, they'll be cooperating with uh, government institutes um, legally, openly, and they'll be sharing everything about us and we may not have much of a, you know, fallback. We know there's a, already some monitoring and things going on, but this will be, I think, the last straw where we are just giving up ourselves, um, possibly in every aspect. And so this is a major concern in terms of, you know, uh, individual rights, human rights, uh, privacy, amana also, because the things we, we discuss on groups, uh, I do counseling, you know, with youngsters, and that's a huge, uh, amana that we take with the with the child or the parent that we do uh, so you know it really has uh, opened up a, a a big can of worms we really have to think seriously yeah yeah it is a um, can of worms well well just for the viewers uh brothers and sisters you know we're not gonna recommend a course of action uh, to you these are product these are products kind of out there but it is an important discussion that's happening in the community and the question of privacy is an important one um, and people will ultimately make their own personal decisions. Uh, so I don't think, you know, that we should perhaps recommend one or the other, but I, I think we can both say and agree that people should respect their privacy. Uh, so, I mean, I'm certainly taking some steps. You've already said that you're con you, you sound like you're considering some serious steps to do so. Yeah, I am. Um, the Turks, because I'm here in Istanbul, some of you might be aware, the... Turkish government has urged the Turks to come up with an alternative, a, a local version that respects a lot of human rights, 
and Islamic values and uh, principles. And so they're encouraged to use a domestic one here. Um, and so the Turks, we know how sophisticated, how, mashallah, clever they are. They're on it. Um, but globally, yeah, but globally, we still have a problem. Um, and it is going to be a big concern, you know. It's, um, but again, it's this issue about withdrawal symptoms, even for me. If I'm gone from WhatsApp, how are my contacts? They're going to contact me, and we're, they're adding, you know, different people I'm meeting because we're here um, doing a 12-day Tahil and Duat program. Okay, and we have 30 uh, people from Palestine, Jerusalem, Al Quds, and they're going through a 12-day program. And you know, we're exchanging, networking every day. We have several international speakers that are coming. And I'm thinking, my goodness, I'll have to go off grid, as it were, quote unquote, off grid, yeah. off the radar. Yeah. Can I do it? Yeah. Sometimes you have to, right? But sometimes your, your work is dependent on these kind of things. And if your work is dependent, then I guess on principle, um, you know, what the there isn't one chat app out there. There are others and people can and they're all as free as each other. Uh, so, so I guess you know people can, you know people can. If you're gonna, if you're, if you're not gonna respect your private privacy, then you can be really generous and have all of them on there, so people can communicate with you. <laughs> I guess. But anyway, let's move on from this one, inshallah ta'ala. Like I said, people should be concerned about these things. I don't think, for a lot of people, it's not about privacy. People aren't on there, you know, di discussing um, dodgy, dodgy things, but. It's a principle, right? Privacy should be respect, respected as a matter of principle because morally that is the right thing to do. And when people don't stand up for that, when companies who really don't need any more money don't stand up for that, then, uh, then on principle, people who actually have no other means of making their voices heard and no other means to make a stand should at least be able to on principle even make some sort of a gesture of opposition so it's a question of principle it isn't so much a question of privacy and it isn't so much that i'm 100 percent secure elsewhere but it's just a question of there is a difference between kind of blatantly exploiting my details for money and nothing else really and 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 between perhaps others who who won't do that or at least aren't declaring to do that um i personally wouldn't trust my my pers my privacy to anyone. I think I trust myself with my privacy, but um, there are still principles at play, and that's really the message I'd like uh, our viewers to take away. Inshallah, Taala. Okay, let's move on from this one. So, Sheikh Yusuf, um, another question has come in, uh, which is, um, and this would be interesting actually for the two of us to discuss. Uh, and the question is, why do we see different formats of Juma prayer? So, I'm going to let you start off on that one, Inshallah. Different formats. Okay, yeah, very good one. Um, let me give you the experiences when I came back from Medina and I went to England in uh, 2018. So there was a whole 10 years I've been in Saudi. And so a lot of things change, a lot of my fit and things are kind of transitioning, transitioning from, let's say, the Hanafi madhab, which we grew up on, and then adopting some Hanbali and Salafi things, right? There's all these alert keywords now coming in. Um, and so when I came back, I did get invited to a number of masajids, but um, there were a number of conditions in the sense for the khutbah itself anyway. Um, they said, you gotta do the whole, you gotta do a lecture before we start. Then you have the adhan then your khutbah has to be 100% in Arabic. I said, but 90% of our people don't speak Arabic. They said, well, that's, that's the way it is. So I had to learn some scripts, understand you know, du'as and hadith and anything. And so there was a duplication. There would be the lecture. Then inside the khutbah, there'll be a repetition. Um, until I got invited to Swansea which is also a Bengali stronghold, Bengali mosque. And there were some youngsters there. And I went there and um, I said, okay, what, what's your format, guys? And they said, do whatever you want, the khutbah, you want to do a bit of Arabic, a bit of English. And I was taken back. I thought, 
no one um, does this. Um, and I was, you know, it was, it was good. I could express myself um, because I was given khutbahs in Jeddah at a center for English speaking Muslims, a lot of reverts. And it was all in English except the necessary dua and these kind of things. So, um, yeah, so there is a bit of a, what can we say? Um, fixation. And there's a kind of this misunderstanding, but it's slowly, slowly now uh, opening up here yeah, in the UK. But still, though, this issue about, and again, I think it comes from the uh, Abu ha uh, the, Hanif uh, the Hanifi madhab, where, you know, they're very adamant that it has to be uh, all in Arabic yeah. from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously the, wide, the wider question here is why do we see the, why do we see different formats of anything, of any of, the, of our acts of worship? And I think... We've discussed this so many times on this show that most people, um, most people know the answer, and that is because of differences of opinion among the jurists and how the madhabs evolved and so on. And there's a whole there's a whole conversation to be had there. But I want to I've had similar experiences, but obviously my evolution has been the other way, Dr. Yusuf. So I've gone from um, not knowing any other way, never ever knowing that it was permissible never even thinking that it was permissible to do the hot Friday khutbah in any other language because nobody did it in my experience during my student days and then when I graduated in 97 I came out and I think this new uh, method had started to uh, to unfold and for a long time I stuck to my guns not well not for that long but at least Practically for a long time, but intellectually and in terms of my the, the, the opinion that I followed, I kind of stuck to it until I met, um, and this is interesting because these are Hanafi scholars, right? So until I met Sheikh uh, Salman al Hussein al Nadwi uh, of, uh, of Lucknow of India, he's of course the, the grandson uh, through his niece, the, the grandson of Sheikh Abdul Hassan al Nadwi, you know, who is a, who is a Hanafi. Yes, slightly different track, perhaps with the Nadwis, but who's a, they're, they're strictly speaking. And he started visiting the UK, and not only did he deem it permissible, but he led to my East London Masjid where he did the khutbah in Urdu. Um, so suddenly there was, in the, you know, in fact, when Sheikh Salman used to deliver uh, durus here, people used to say to him, How come you have this opinion that it's permissible being a Hanafi when? Other shuyukh like Mufti Tafir Uthmani have written on the mas'ala saying that it isn't permissible to give the Friday khutbah in anything other than Arabic. So, and he, you know, Shasana, with all due respect, basically expresses his difference of opinion on the matter. And the thing I'm trying to clarify here is that while some of the other issues of difference of opinion are kind of along madhab boundaries, this mas'ala isn't necessarily so. And there are people within the madhab uh, that actually deem it permissible. Um, and and a lot of people are changing their practice. I certainly have done. But however, what I do is I respect the masjid and I respect the wishes of the masjid. And if they want it, but I try to convince them to let me do it in English because it's just so much easier. So many things work out when you do one khutbah, basically one talk, and it's in the and it's in the language that people understand. Suddenly, people actually attend the khutbah. When I start doing a khutbah in other than which my regular one, which I do, which I uh, lead uh, every so often in my local masjid. Funny enough, we do the the traditional one, which is we do in we do in a Bengali. I do a Bengali English talk, and then uh, you know there's adhan and people pray the sunnah, and then basically there's the adhan again and the khutbah in Arabic, and nobody attends the the talk. Basically, I start the talk with five people in the masjid. I end the talk with about half the masjid full, right? Which means half the people really didn't benefit at all from what is probably the one opportunity in the week for them to listen to some advice. So anyway, so, and the reason why I'm saying that and putting that out to people is because people who are involved in managing masjid should consider this change. However, the other bit of diplomatic advice I give people is people should also respect the opinion of their imam. And whatever the, however the imam wants to lead based on his inclination, people should accept that, right? And not cause friction by opposing the imam, etc. Because sometimes you've appointed a scholar and he will have his own convictions and you have to respect that. 
So, so respect the, as imams, we respect the wishes of the masajid. The issue is is flexible, inshallah. It's, a, it's, it's an ijtihadi matter. And musallis, you, the viewers, when you pray Jumu'ah, uh, as convincing as mine and Dr. Yusuf's argument may be, you should respect the practice of your imam. And, you know, perhaps suggest um, to your imams that they maybe make some adjustments that that they can accept because there are other ways to, to, to make things much more beneficial to the people in terms of taking away a weekly bit of advice. Anyway, I think I'll stop, uh, I'll let me, stop at yeah. that. Let me just add though, something very strange when I came here and started attending the uh, Jum'ahs because you know, mashallah, the mosques have never been closed here during the pandemic and the regular prayers. Yeah, of course, we have the mask and the social distancing, even in the salah, and the shoes and everything are packed outside. Um, but the funny thing is, we know the Ottomans and the Turks are Hanafis. Yeah. You know, pretty down the line, but a couple of things are fundamentally different. One, the, the beard size, you will be very, you know, rare to find a Turk with a beard as long as mine. Uh, it's usually very short or no beard. Yeah. Um, but the biggest observation was the Juma Khutbah. It's a national one that comes from the government. I get the transcript from a friend. So every masjid has the same khutbah, but it's actually a cocktail of Arabic and Turkish. Yeah. Every single masjid here. Yeah, and no, so so not all not all Hanafis are the same. So I think that exactly. what, what I think that the, the point to take away from this for our viewers is that uh, there even within the madhabs there are different tracks. And you know, and I always say that people should receive their knowledge from people, from other people, and not, you shouldn't leapfrog the scholars before you, the scholars who are in your lives, and, and, and go online and, and start rummaging around yourselves because it will lead to nothing but confusion. And that usually means that you will also be subject to the opinions that they prefer, and you should try to respect that, you know, in a way that, that, that doesn't cause discord and disunity in the community and it's easily done i think if we if we all have our hearts and minds in the right place then it is easily done like that um, but that's actually really, really interesting and by the way i i actually never it never i never thought about what they're doing in turkey whether the masajid are closed or not but jazakallah for that I, now i know so they didn't close the masajid in pakistan and they didn't close the masajid in turkey either and i think both places i don't know what it's like in terms of managing covid in turkey but Pakistan's policy is being celebrated now. Apparently, they're, they've successfully turned the crisis around, even though their masajid are open. That's really interesting. Uh, do they have a handle on things in Turkey? Yeah, they do. The rates are nowhere as near as bad as the UK. Um, the daily curfew, there is a 9, 9 p.m. curfew. Um, the restaurants, no eating at, um in um and what else but everything else is you know the, it's normal as as it can be and there is a weekend lockdown as well weekend is only for necessities yeah so groceries a household can go um but there's something else very interesting as well what they've done is for the tourists even during the lockdown there's an exemption so right now at nine o'clock me i'm still waiting for my residency i'm kind of considered as a tourist I can actually go out after nine and walk around, and we do. And the police and things, they, they'll overlook it. Yeah, which is interesting, giving a bit of flexibility to the visitors. And, they, you know, they're That's a lot smaller in number because the majority is the, is the residents, which are tucked away by 9 p.m. Yeah. yeah, which is great for tourists as well, isn't it? <laughs> it's a completely new, different experience for them. All right, so um, let's move on because actually we can linger on a single question and finish the whole show. So, but let's, let's try and take some more questions. So the next question has come in here. So, um, and I hope it's a question actually. Let me have a quick look, right. So, um, uh, Assalamu Alaikum. The masjids are closed, were closed in March due to the fear that COVID will spread. Well, I took the stance that on principle to preserve um to preserve necessities or preserve lives to preserve lives necessitates the closure of masajid why are mosques and ulama taking a different stance now 
Do we need the government to tell us to close? Should they not close using the same principle as in March? All right. Well, I'm kind of hosting, Sheikh Yusuf, so you're always going to go first. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a difficult one in England. You know why? You've got a couple of things. The the laws and the qawaneen of the land, you know, for us to respect and to abide by that, that takes a, a precedence in some case. Um, in terms of the precautionary measures, a lot of it we know our guesswork. Yeah, that we know that how, we don't know, the scientists and the medics don't know how effective the mask is. Even some experts have said the mask is counterproductive. Okay, so there's definitely a question mark on which preventative measures um, are effective, which aren't. Um, in terms of how it's spread, there's also a question mark, you know, in terms of the transition of uh, the, the disease hopping from people to people. Um, you know, in light of that, there should be um, mosques should make their individual decisions. I think right now, or last week, I can say in Bristol, for example, big divide. Some mosques are shut, some stayed open. And even I think in up north, Bolton and things, um, because some people are posting on social media, there's still some gatherings in terms of social distance, masjid gatherings. Um, so there's a divide now. Some mosques are saying, no, we're going to you know, stay open a little bit. Others are saying, no, 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 we're going to shut. Yeah, and some are doing it, of course, to uh, respect the laws of the land, to abide by community principles, to look at the bigger picture. So I really... Um, it's difficult, really. Honestly, it is very difficult, I think, to get that balance, to keep it open or not. Yeah. So um, I think we've got a break coming up. I'm just waiting to find out how long we have and whether we can continue discussing this. Um, OK, so we've got a bit of time. So, um, so I have a little bit of kind of inside info about this. I can't reveal sources yet, but... Uh, there's two things, isn't it, going on here? Number one, there's a number of things are different from March. Um, in March, we knew very little about the virus, right? So most precautions were basically on the just on the basis of um, how many people were getting infected, not knowing how the NHS is going to handle it, um, uh, seeing how because sometimes when you when you're dealing with a new crisis. The only thing you have going for you is what's happening in other countries. And Italy, Spain, countries like that were a few weeks ahead of us. And generally, uh, there was a there was a quite an informed assumption that that's the direction we're headed in, right? So I think most of us knew that a shutdown of the masajid is coming and people had already started to die. In my area, for example, the complaints had already started coming through that my father went to Jumeirah last week. The massage didn't close today. This week he's in hospital. I had no, personally no stories like that. And remember, there was complete uncertainty. So we didn't know statistics on how dangerous it was to go to massage and what the spread would be like. And remember, in the, the, the current practices in terms of um, social distancing and all of that stuff wasn't in place. So you had the virus spreading and you had people praying in the masjid as normal. Right. So I think. With all of that taken into consideration, there was a different reason. For, it was a different, uh, if you like, environment in terms of why we're taking precautions. We were partly taking precautions because we we didn't know much, right? And the dangers were before us based on what was happening in other countries. And that's why a lot of the ulama kind of went ahead. I personally actually called Masajid up to convince them to, to stop, right? And, and stop their services. This... I'm still uneasy about massages staying open. However, there's a number of things that are different. Number one, we actually now have data about, about what the spread is like in places of worship. And I recently actually saw some of that. It was shared with me and it's actually extremely low. And that, before I saw that, I was really uneasy. I was actually on the brink of calling massages up again to ask them, look guys, perhaps you need to, because um, I don't know what it's. I don't know what it's like in other towns and cities. Well, I do have some idea, but in where I am in Tower Hamlets, it's really bad. It's awful. And I personally, 
um, receive daily announcements of two or three deaths, right, in Thai hamlets. You know, and I know I have friends who work at Gardens of Peace and I regularly take updates from them on the number of COVID burials that they do every week. And my last check, which was last week, the number of COVID deaths at Gardens of Peace was at 20 per, uh, 20 per day. Right, it was nearing, it wasn't at 20 per day, it was nearing 20 per day. Whereas just a week before that, they had told me that they had done 30 in the whole week. COVID deaths, there's more deaths altogether. And the average during the year outside of COVID is 20 altogether. This is a Muslim graveyard. This is not, everybody's not buried there. Mostly people from the kind of East London region are buried in Hainault, in Gardens of Peace, right? So things are bad. So with that in mind, you know, I thought, okay, this is a concern. But then those statistics came through that the risk is indeed very, very low. Um, uh, so we have some more information. We have some understanding of how the virus is traveling and where it's traveling more and where it's not, where it's traveling less. But there are still uncertainties. If you study more about the virus, you will see that it's still uncertain, which is why. And the government therefore also hasn't told us to close our masajid. I think for that reason, I think a sensible way to do it, although I've been told by other brothers who are active in uh, and leading the community that this is something that the community won't listen to. But you and I are both here, Dr. Yusuf, I think we can say this to people. And that is that people should follow localized advice. For example, in many boroughs, um, I have a student who's a counselor in one of the London boroughs, and he told me that their borough, even though the government gave advice, as a local authority, they're uh, in, uh, they're advising massages to close. And I think that makes sense because they have a better understanding of how the low by, by the virus and particularly how ethnic minorities specifically are being affected by, by the virus because we know that we have, uh, the, the vulnerabilities are different with us, they're greater. Um, so I think on that basis, you know, the other day I was looking at um, Tower Hamlets and about half the masajid in Thai Hamlets are closed and about half are open. But there's an irony in all of this, which makes me really uneasy, right? And that is that the area where the most masjids are open, the ward, if you go by council wards, if the, way, the ward where the most masjids are open is also the ward where, there are, where there's the highest infections. So in conclusion, because I think we're out of time, what I want to say is, uh, if the brothers could let us know how much time we have, what I want to say is, um, I don't think people should be absolutist about this, right? I think we should respect the, the decision that our local masjid is taking, whether it is for closing, whether it is for uh, remaining open, we should respect that decision. But the masjids should make those decisions in conjunction with their local authorities' advice and make an informed decision, not an emotional one, based on what I have started to call a kind of a kind of pious heroism, you know, like we're going to make a stand against the virus. Our masjid is going to remain open. We're going to make a stand for piety, for Islam, for the jama'a, etc., etc. This is not the attitude to take. Make an informed, rational decision based upon an evaluation of the situation and the dangers and the risks, etc. The risks are low, so there is scope to remain open. However, the risks are not the same everywhere. So make a localized decision. That would be my uh, my advice. And if your masjid is closed. Don't go and pack out another masjid, right? Honestly, that doesn't make any sense. Like, one must must fifty percent of the masjids in a in a in a in a ward closed, so now the other fifty percent have to deal with an increased crowd, right? And congestion, and therefore risk the virus spreading because of that. And these are some of the dangers. I think everybody has to be responsible, not just about their dean, but they have to be responsible about the virus and the fact that there is a pandemic. Those, those are my thoughts on this. Uh, I'm not being told we're out of time, Sheikh Yusuf, so we can carry on. Yeah, no, no, it's good. That's, I think we, like I mentioned, we need to follow the guidelines. All right. There's a break. Cool. So we have a break, so we can go for the break. All right, oh, yeah. so if we want to carry on discussing, I didn't hear that very well at all, but if we want to carry on having the discussion, inshallah ta'ala, we can. But we're going to go for a quick break first, uh, and then we'll be back. There are some more questions in, by the way, so inshallah we'll get to them. Stay with us, brothers and sisters. 
and we will catch you on the other side of the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, respected viewers, welcome back. So we're going to continue this show, inshallah ta'ala, what's up, Sheikh, with myself today and uh, Sheikh Yusuf Abdul Jabbar. Both of us are on the show today, so we're both kind of taking your questions, but also discussing them among ourselves. So slightly different, it's because our, our hosts aren't with us today, inshallah. So we, before this, we were discussing the conflicting advice about closing Masajid at the moment, and somebody had sent a question in saying, you know, why, are we, why do we have a different um, why do we have a different attitude towards it than before? Someone actually spoke to me the other day and said that we, uh, although although this time around everybody's using the excuse that because the government hasn't um, told us to close the masajid down, um, we're not closing them down. However, last time, if you follow the chronology of events, then many masajid and ulama had preemptively um, T- uh, had, had had offered had given the advice that masajid should close even though the government strictly speaking had it yet closed them down and i thought about that and i re- remembered that that was true we did actually preemptively say it uh, which is why it was quite contentious in the community so anyway but i think we've answered that uh dr Yusuf, did you want to add anything to that to what we said before um just my point when i started is that it's very difficult so apparently because of the community are very passionate about the Salah, and it's uh, very dear to us. Um, at the same time, what is dear to us is also uh, following the rules and regs of the land and also sticking to looking at the greater Masalaha, you know, the greater benefit of the wider community, not to be selfish, etc. So the best thing I agree with you is to go with your local um, jurisdiction or local area and be patient upon it. And the reward you'll get anyway for the intention that if you regularly attended a masjid, you will still get that reward, inshallah, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not take that away from you because of the dhuruf. So, inshallah, we're not losing anything. Okay, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Uh, yeah, I think we've covered that um, fully. Uh, okay, so I have we have some more questions. Um, mashallah, questions are coming in today. So, um, the question is, is following a stricter opinion within a madhab better than following an opinion within the same madhab which is easier or more doable in the west okay Um. good (laughs) um no it's interesting let me tell you why we've got um these guys have come from uh jerusalem and we have four jewish converts that have embraced islam from the holy city and they're mashallah yeah, um, uh, and you know, the one of the guys has said to me actually, and he understands, he kind of says, we, we're always trying to look for the, like to be hero, you know, to take the harder options. And he says, from my end, he's been Muslim for six years, got four children, he's married, and he, you know, he's mashallah progress Allah. He's actually translated um, the Quran recently into Hebrew, and you'll find it in uh, the Blue Mosque and things, you know. Wow. Uh, because there are, recently there hasn't been many translations into Hebrew, um, you know. So it's a massive effort, and he has uh, has a good gra- grapple on these things. And he says, "Look, we we shouldn't opt for the harder option. Islam is if there are rochas, there are leniencies. If there are easier, we should stick to the spirit of the law mm-hmm. and go for those options." So, um, but some some people want to be heroes, don't they? Um, and I would say in this day and age when things are already difficult and complicated, especially for the youngsters, not to add another layer of a, a challenge because it's already complicated enough because they mentioned West at the end of the question. It's already very difficult for us these days. Um, somebody asked last time about Jum'a and I think it was from the Hanafi mother and he said, is it okay for me to pray just the two Jum'a and disappear? You know, and this will be frowned upon from the Hanafi mother. Then I kind of said, well, you're going to go halfway. If you can't read the other 10 rakah of Sunan, at least do another two or four. That's a good so answer. That, <laughs> yeah, so that your, let's say your uh, fard is not completely unprotected. You've got some gaps that you can fill with the Sunan. But a lot of people frown upon and say, no, if you're Hanafi in that mother, you've got to pray the Sunan. Um, so I think in this time's... 
uh, time and age, I would say don't try to be the hero because we've got enough challenges. If there is a marochas and leniency, take it and don't feel guilty that this is you're doing any disservice because it's still within the Quran and Sunnah. Mm, so, yeah, so I think I broadly agree with that. The only, uh, and obviously, there's, there's actually kind of uh, polar opposite attitudes with regards, not polar opposite, but there's kind of different emphases among even contemporary ulama with regards to the, the, what they take as their primary principle. Um, so some take their primary principle as precaution and a kind of safeguarding our deen from being, um, from, uh, from suffering, if you like, from our laziness and uh, and so on, and they're worried that if we just keep giving people leeway, then eventually you end up with nothing. You end up basically with with people barely struggling to hold on to their fob. And there is some there's some, there is some wisdom to that. But on the other hand, there is a strong argument that the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam clearly um, told us um, the importance of facilitating ease for people. And uh, you know, Bashira wala tu nafira, yasira wala tu asira. The hadith are well known, and and there's verses as well. Majala alikum fi dini min haraj, etc. Now, but the th- there's a little bit of nuance here that I want to share with people, and that is that there's a difference between a scholar being advised to go easy in his fatawa, and a person making a personal decision with regards to just taking it easy for themselves. Okay, and I think there's a quite a useful thing to consider here, which is that, yes, principally, scholars should advise people based on ease. And I absolutely would insist on that as far as muftis and ulama are concerned. Go easy on people, right? Stop making their life hard and stop pushing personal standards of piety upon people in your fatawa, right? But you, and you know, as a as as somebody who wants to practice your deen, your priority should be to want to practice your deen sincerely, right? And not want to seek loopholes unless those loopholes are are available. But how do you make that judgment, right? Now the question is worded as though you're asking me to empower you to make that judgment for you, for yourself. I would, as I always do, I would advise that you that you make that decision on the advice of a scholar even if it means that you have to go and visit a few even if it means that however if you're a student of knowledge and you have some understanding of the issues at hand then perhaps you can make your own decision as for this specific question i think the 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 person who's asked the question has asked it quite intelligently you've kind of helped yourself along in the question so let me quickly use the question to finally kind of just help you out is following a stricter opinion within a madhab better than following an opinion within the same madhab, which is easier and more doable in the West? You see, this is normally phrased in terms of an easier opinion outside of the madhab. And the kind of people who are who are who tend to be firm on madhab boundaries frown upon that because they say it's going to open the door to people doing whatever they want. But if it is an easier opinion within the madhab, then it's kind of, what I had already advised before has already been done for you. Within the madhab, an easier opinion is available. And if that opinion happens to be from people who are, who, who are highly regarded within the madhab, then that's a lot easier, I would say. All right. And people can take the easier option. And my last comment is that the sharia is much, much more flexible. Or the sharia is much easier when it comes to when it comes to people following an easier opinion when it's a matter of necessity and need right that's when it's a much easier decision there's no question about both ulama making things easy uh, for themselves as well as people seeking to seeking ease for themselves as far as personal suffering and difficulty etc etc is concerned in matters of worship there's there's this kind of dichotomy between seeking a higher spiritual standard and making life easy for ourselves. And I think there's no doubt that we should all want to seek a higher spiritual standard, 
However, if that proves difficult, but you also want to hold on to your deen and so on and so forth, then follow the Prophet ﷺ's advice, which is, uh, you know, what I command you to do, do the best you can, right? So, you know, fulfill your fara'id, and there's no question about that. There is no compromise in that. But after that, do the best you can. Don't descend into a situation where you're doing nothing. You're not doing your sunan, you're not doing your nawafil, you're not doing tahajjud, you're not doing anything. It's like, I'm just going to do my part. It is still something. And I congratulate you for that because there's millions of people who aren't even doing that. But your aspiration always and your commitment should be to want to do more. And I think Shaykh Yusuf was alluding to that as well, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, next question. because We can both talk till, uh, till Fajr. So next question is, um, is stocks and shares halal, Shaykh Yusuf? Um, there is uh, three three types. Um, the stocks and shares can be kind of divided into three. Um, mm -hmm. One companies that are, are clearly trading in um, halal products and services. So, what can we give a a cement company, a company that. Uh, is is involved in making cement and bricks and houses. So we know the the trade is halal. That activity, there's no issues with that. So if a person was to buy shares in that, that's halal. That's done. The other side, we know the other option. The opposite is a company that makes adult magazines. That's one of the forbidden um, industries from the Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things that are harmful to society and people has no value. Um, likewise, wine companies, you know, there might be a bottle of wine that is worth, it's 30 years vintage, France, it's worth $2,000 in the market. In the eyes of the Sharia, it's, it's zero, it's nothing because it's, uh, and it's, um, so it has no value. So a company or a product or service that's clear cut in those territories, you can't invest in that. Problem is the one in the middle. You may have a company um, that manufactures um, furniture. Okay, so the bulk of the company is good, but it has also loans, huge amount of loans that is interest bearing. Now you've got a problem. The, the usul of the company, the product it's selling is halal. There's nothing wrong with manufacturing furniture and chairs but it's involved in some other things that are uh, haram. Uh, and so these companies, you can't directly invest, but there, there's an analysis has to be done. And you have the Islamic um, indices, Dowie Jawi, Jones, where companies are checked for, uh, what do you call it, Sharia compliancy. And they say, yep, this one is okay. Although there is some amount of loaning, it's negligible, it can be overseen. So these are the three you have to really, if you want to seriously, seriously invest, look at the Dowie Jones, and the other end, they have um, Islamic uh, companies that are approved by senior scholars. And so you can invest in those. The other ones that are clear cut, not involved in uh, haram, that you can invest with the- And um, where can people go for that information? Um, the indices are, uh, the, they're, they're on, uh, on the net. Okay. Yes, so but there is, yeah. you know, you've got the New York Stock Exchange and then you've got the uh, Islamic um, portfolio also. Okay, all right, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. The only thing I would um, I would say is that um, another form of kind of these people in of, of the of that third category in the middle is there's a lot of companies who basically that it's not so much the practice of relying on loans etc. But also a lot of companies actually have mixed products, so they have halal halal products as well as haram products. So obviously it's not as clear cut as if all the products were halal. Um, one rule that I've read in some fatawa is that if the majority of the business is deemed to be permissible, then it is permissible to invest in them. If not, then not. I don't know what other fatwa say about that, but at least that's um, uh, one kind of one way in which ulama guide this matter. But um, 
but if there is some sort of formal advisory on this, as Sheikh Yusuf said, then that's, that's even better and you should look that up, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so uh, next question then. So this one's a, you know, this one's a kind of an academic one, Sheikh Yusuf. Or we can perhaps discuss here. I don't, if, if we could be told how long we have left, because I don't suppose we have much time left. Um, so we've got five minutes, right? And so maybe we can we can probably end on this one. So the question, uh, the question, and the brother or sister has said, please don't paraphrase this one. Um, is uh, my question is related to Orientalist books on Islam? Bat Yiro, uh, I think that's how that's how it's pronounced. Um, a prominent writer on Islam wrote in one of her books that under the Islamic fiqhi rules, a non-Muslim is not allowed to give testimony against a Muslim. My question is, does that compromise or violate the very importance in the commandment of justice stated in the Quran for the society? Uh, by not giving fair treatment in the court systems, doesn't that make it a, a travesty to justice? Kind of a dense question, and it's somewhat, you know, um, it's to do with basically justice uh, in in the Sharia. Sheikh Yusuf, start with your comments, inshallah. Yeah, um, I think if we look at the time of the <coughs> Prophet وسلم, we saw how his treatment with the non-Muslims was exemplary and they had a lot of rights and they would do many things, you know, testify, lots of different things and often the Muslims would uh, lose because the testimony from the non-Muslim was taken and accepted. Um, the issue I think they're talking probably is about, and it's coming from, from the Ottoman era, I think, where there have been, um, it's said that the Ottomans um, institutionalized some biases where non-Muslim testimony at some stage weren't accepted. And so I guess, again, I, I, I don't know if there is a, a consensus amongst the scholars in terms of this issue, but um, the Ottomans may have adopted uh, an opinion where the testimony may not have been held valid. Um, however, the, we know the, uh, the dhimmi or the one who pays jizya has a huge amount of rights uh, and sanctity for their life, property uh, and everything. So it's not reducing uh, much in that sense. But um, if you want to add on to that. Um, okay, so uh, this, this, so first of all, um, I don't think this is simply a matter of something that the Fuqaha have said. Um, I think it's important to understand that the whole conversation the Fuqaha have about this is based on the implication of the of the verse "Wastashidu shahidayni min rijalikum," and that the implication of that verse is that witnesses have to be from from Muslims in a Muslim society, from among Muslims in a Muslim society. However, um, you're right, this is not absolute um, and there are exceptions, okay? But, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I suppose if you look at the, the, the time of the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, then there are clearly examples of testimonies taken from non-Muslims. Uh, so th there's a difference between taking a testimony from someone, as in as in their presentation of their case in court, in front of the Qadi, in front of the judge, and taking somebody's testimony on that case, somebody to be a witness on that case. And here, the shahada that we're talking about, or the testimony that we're talking about, is somebody to stand as a witness in a case. So that's basically the issue. Um, and here, it is true that the that generally speaking, the fuqaha, um, uh, they have, there's some difference of opinion, but the Fuqaha do say that there can be no testimony um, of uh, non-Muslims in uh, in a Muslim society with certain exceptions. And their justification for that is the implication of the verse, so a kind of literalist implication, uh, uh, interpretation of the verse, but also, um, uh, you know, the, in, 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 in those days, there was, the, 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 the generally, there was a sense that uh, that there was an, or rather an, 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 a kind of an assumption as standard that there was an issue of trust. Which brings me to the point that I want to make, and that is that while this is something that we can debate until the cows come home, 
right, as to whether or not and what it should be and should or shouldn't non-Muslims be given the right to testimony um, in, a, in, a, in a Muslim society, in an Islamic society. That will eventually become a question of how we interpret that verse and whether the scope for an interpretation that allows that testimony. It is still purely a matter of jurisprudence, a matter of fiqh. Now, what I, the point I want to make is it's wrong to frame this as a matter of justice. I want to go back to how the question is, is phrased here, right? The question is saying, does that not compromise or violate the very importance in the commandment of justice stated in the Quran for the society, right? And, the, and uh, by not giving fair treatment in the court system, doesn't that make it a travesty to justice? So first and foremost, fair treatment in the court uh, doesn't... So the implication here is if a non-Muslim doesn't testify in court, then it is then then it is not possible for a non-Muslim to receive justice. That assumption is not necessarily correct. That's a false assumption. It is in theory at least possible for the person to all to to receive justice, and not all cases require witnesses. Right, that's one point. The next point I want to make is that if the question of justice in Islam, and if you're if if as Muslims, for example, we take our understanding of justice, our whole epistemology and our law, etc., from the Quran. And we believe after accepting that Allah is the Allah is our is, is our true one Lord and that Muhammad Sallallahu is the true messenger of Allah. Once we accept these basics, we take our law from the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore we we do have a very subjective, very deep assumption that Allah's law is the just law, unless unless it is it is in those areas where, where the law has been heavily interpreted by scholars. Over there, there is some scope because there's room for interpretation and there is a human uh, human contribution to that process, to the process of interpretation. Here, of course, there is there is an element of divinely inspired law, but the human interpretation can be in error. And the Sharia acknowledges this. We know this, right? In So that's the point, right? Now, if as Muslims we were to say some people being excluded from the testimony process is unjust, as a Muslim that makes no sense whatsoever because it would then it would be unjust for uh, for two women to testify uh, in comparison to one man, right? Within Islamic law, within the accepted parameters of Islamic law, not everybody's testimony is the same for various reasons. That is not a bearing on justice in Sharia. So the question of, of, uh, of testimony is one thing. It's a question of jurisprudence, a question of law. The question of justice is another issue. And the question conflates the two and it shouldn't be conflated. All right, I hope that makes sense. With that, Sheikh Yusuf, I'm, I'm being told our time's up. I hope that made se made sense, you know, that, that that what I said. But it's a good question, right? Perhaps not not the kind of question we can regularly take on the show because there's no straightforward yes or no answer. There isn't a halal or haram answer. But one thing I can categorically say that that's got nothing to do with justice. So Shaykh Yusuf, if you can inshallah say your goodbyes to everybody and we can we can we can conclude and we can finish up. All right, good stuff. No, no, mashallah. It's um it's been a pleasure to be on again. But these are the questions actually keep coming up time and time now with the youngsters trying to shake their understanding of Islam to be a, a weak religion, an oppressive religion. So you, these type of doubts will keep coming up. So inshallah, yeah. we do we encourage you guys to keep asking. Don't be scared. Because yeah. Please Islam do. Has, you know, Islam will deal with all of this. Yeah. Yeah, and of course we're happy to take these questions, and both both on the show as well as ourselves individually, inshallah ta'ala, um, in our own limited capacity, we'll try our best. Jazakumullah khairan, brothers and sisters. I hope you enjoyed that. It's very different today, um, and maybe we should deliberately do this every now and then because I certainly enjoyed it. And Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.